I got told about this little tiny strip right here. I was like, nope. No way that shit clean, clean, gonna clean my clothes. I know I'm just jumping into this, but yeah. I brought it home and we like we used it for a couple of weeks and I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe it's actually effective. We sold our first product. We opened the website on April 2nd, 2019. We got to like an eight figure okay. run rate in like eight months. We raised approximately three years into the growth, but before that it was all bootstrapped. Oh, you bootstrapped it. So from 2019, no no outside investment, huh? What are you, what are you guys at now? Like strong mid eight figures. Wow. Good morning, marketers. Today, we've got Ryan McKenzie, founder of True Earth with us. Also got... Hey, everybody. I'm Andrew, founder of YT Era. And Tom. How's it going? Tom here. <laughs> we got Ryan on here today to talk to us a bit about e-commerce marketing. I've been in digital marketing for, I don't know, over 12 years. But the one area that I have the least amount of skills in is in selling physical products, e-commerce. I never got into it. Um, I always just thought that there wasn't enough margins in it. Too much headache, too much work. There's a lot of reasons why I actually don't like e-commerce. Maybe, Ryan, you could change my mind about this. I'm now getting into a project that's all about e-commerce that I think is going to be very successful. So that's why I'm, I'm very curious about that. And I just know Ryan for a long time now. You know where we first met Ryan was at in Victoria. Do you remember? Yes, I, I do remember. That was social media camp, marketing camp? Yeah, social media camp. There's one thing I learned about whenever you go to like networking events... Right, I learned this with another friend of mine, uh, Dan, Dan Johnson. We used to talk about this. If you want to make like friends for life, what you got to do is be the last one to leave. So you go to a networking event and you just make sure you fucking stay until the end. I think we were out probably until like two in the morning or something like that. Every time. <laughs> yeah. But that that's the key to like really like me. So that's how uh, Ryan and I, you know, we got to know each other there. And then, we, you know, I think we attended TNC together. And then I just started hearing about some success, success that you were having with subscription boxes that I want to talk about. But then I also found out about True Earth. I remember you doing True Earth. And then I think I saw True Earth and like in the grocery store or something. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, isn't that Ryan's business? <laughs> and then, yeah. No. And then, like I looked you up. Yeah. And I remember one day I, I saw in the store and then like I went back and like I looked you up on Facebook and then, like I Googled it. I'm like, oh, I was like, it's a pretty big company now. So I want to talk about that. I'm very curious. And I'm also, I would like to talk about a bit about True Earth because I've, I've never used it before. And I, and oh, I wanna, what? I want to tell you. Oh my God. I want to tell I you why. I want ever... to tell you why. I think I know your customer's biggest obstacle to buying. I think I know what it is. But first, let's go to... They don't believe that it works. I don't believe that it works. I know you don't. <laughs> I didn't believe... I know. I didn't Because believe. I'm always like, there's no dude, way. Dude. I, dude, when I got told about this little tiny strip right here, I was like, nope, no way that shit clean, clean, gonna clean my clothes. I know I'm just jumping into this, but yeah. I brought it home and we like, we used it for a couple of weeks and I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe it's actually effective. Okay, Ryan, let's do this. Let's just go right into does this thing work, okay? I'm telling you, I've never bought it because I don't think it's gonna work, all right? You're just waiting for me to send you some, I think. This is, this is like, <laughs> you invite a guest on, uh, onto the show. You're like, your product <laughs> probably doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But what's funny is that I see everyone talk about how much they love it. Like you're, you're like the mom's market. I've looked into this before. I was very curious when, when I first like realized this is like a huge business. I was looking into it quite a bit. Your customers love the product. And for that reason, I would believe that it works. But for some reason, I just can never get myself to actually try it. So explain to me. You're like, screw Ryan. <clears throat> I'm not buying it. I'm, this is spite. No. No. <laughs> I just, I have to interrupt because this is bugging me. Ryan, when you threw it, it landed on your head, man. You got to get that. I, I can't focus. I just, I can't focus. <laughs> I can't focus. I know. Dude, it's a pattern interrupt. I'm like, I'm just going to leave it there for <laughs> the whole episode. So I, first of all, I bought it. I can't. I was like, I'm not paying attention to anything. <laughs> I didn't even notice like, that. Ryan, get it off your head, man. <laughs> so right, I, I usually get my detergent at Costco, which is probably why I have not actually uh, purchased it for, for real. It is available. It is available on Costco. .ca. Oh, really? Okay. This is the Costco size package. When are you guys breaking into the US market? Into uh, retail. We're, we're pretty big in the U.S. already. We're in all public stores. We're in a bunch of Kroger, Fred Meyer, Giant in Pennsylvania, or wherever Giants are. Uh, we're like 7,000 stores around North America. So I meant for Costco specifically, since we brought it up. I'm just curious. Is that a play for you guys or no, not so much? How does that whole, wor that whole world work? Retail is an, interesting, is an interesting game that not a lot of people actually talk about. Uh, because most people like in these kind of circles are primarily running like digital marketing, but uh, big box retail generally has longer cycles. So you have to 
there's usually like once per year where you can actually get in there and be like, this is the thing that we want to do. And they introduce that to the category. And I talked to somebody yesterday that was like, oh, I want to get into retail. But the tricky part about getting into retail is you need to have the relationships. You need to understand how to pitch them. You need to know what they want and you need to be able to get in there and nail it the time that when you get in there to, to do it and be able to support the product in store so that people go there and actually buy through. Because if you don't sell through, they kick you out of the store and then you're never coming back. So Ryan, just real quick, some people are not going to know what this product is. Okay. Typical laundry detergent requires a liquid mix that you would buy. It's very heavy and it comes in a plastic container. Yes. These containers cause uh, a lot of uh, issues with the environment and recycling, all that kind of stuff, because most of those things that get recycled don't really get recycled, right? I know the story in terms Correct. of the environmental issues when it comes to laundry detergent. When I have my washer, right, I have a front loading washer. And I usually put the laundry detergent in the little, you know, you open the little thing and put yep. the laundry detergent in and then you close it and then it like puts it in there, right? So what you have is a little strip. I guess it's a, it looks like a piece of paper. You just had it on your head, right? And it would, I assume, dissolve in the water and somehow actually wash your clothes, that piece of paper. That's correct. Is it like dried soap or like what is that no so i mean you want to get into the science of how dish washing wa like liquid laundry detergent works i just want to do it real quick for like my mom's gonna watch this second grader level for us please yeah so yeah so basically what happens is your laundry machine you put the clothes in there they spin around that creates mechanical movement that generally dislodges dirt or whatever right what happens is you when you put laundry detergent into the water it changes the ionization of the water and then there's these little molecules that glob onto dirt. Once they wrap around the dirt, since the water ionization is reversed, I can't remember if it's negative or positive, it pushes all of the dirt that is surrounded by these molecules away from your clothes, and then it gets flushed out. That's called a surfactant. So basically your, your laundry detergent consists of something that changes the ionization of the water oh. and a, another thing that binds to dirt so that it goes away from your clothes. This consists of those ingredients at a pre-dose concentration that does the job. So do you think that in terms of like the market and, and me, you know, not understanding that sort of thing, do you think that that's preventing some, like, I don't know, like I kind of get the idea of what you're saying. It's science, right? Yeah. Like soap is like soapy and like it smells good and like, you know, that sort of thing. So I mean, it's going to like right. do a better job washing my clothes. Like, you know, is that even true? Like, yeah. So like laundry detergent isn't soap though. You know, like it's like, it's a little bit different than soap. It's close, but. Oh, it's not. Oh, interesting. So detergent is slightly different than a soap. So when you look at like liquid detergent, right? Is there like actually different qualities of detergent you, you would say? Yeah, for sure. Depends on how, how well they ionize the water. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's also other things like they could have enzymes, which are like almost like a virus that that cleaves certain material. There's a number of factors that contribute to the actual benefit or how well the efficacy. Will True Earth like also help with like keeping my clothes in good quality? I don't want to make any claims that get me in any sort of legal trouble, but oh, okay, you know, okay, at the okay. end of the day, if you're if you're using less chemicals on your clothes, you, you, the hypothesis would be that they, they should potentially last longer. Huh, interesting. All right, I'm going to buy a, a box of uh, True Earth. I, I, will, I will send you guys all a package so you can experience it firsthand, and then you're going to be like, this takes up so much less space, and it's so much easier, and it actually kind of feels cool to do laundry for a bit. <laughs> As my personal apology for never buying it in the past, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to buy like three boxes. Listen, I forgive, I forgive you. For everybody in my family um, for next Christmas, next year. <laughs> I was actually just on the website wondering if I could order it to uh, have it get it shipped to Costa Rica. Are you guys in Costa Rica? Probably not. I'd, I'd be shocked if you're in Costa Rica. I'd have to have it get shipped to me, right? Yeah, we, we might be. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. There's like we're in like 80 countries. I'm not sure. Yep. You might be here then. I just got to do my homework. Okay, I got to ask. This is a subject everyone is tired of talking about, but like Matt, I have uh, zero experience in e-commerce and physical goods. I'm all about digital products as well. And I know everyone's sick and tired of talking about it, but uh, how did how did COVID and supply chain management affect you guys and how did you respond? I got to know. I got to ask that. Yeah. You know, you know, it's crazy. We actually did something pretty, pretty innovative. So like we were terrified because this business was really new and we were literally packaging this product by hand. Like we had, we'd have people stacking up, counting the number of, of units and putting them in packages because we just, we grew so fast. We didn't get to a point where we had automation and that created a huge challenge because COVID you couldn't get a whole bunch of people in the same room. So the demand that we were generating was so much higher than we could possibly fit in the allocated space that you were allowed for, for humans during COVID. So what we did is we made like this like skip the dishes type thing for work. And we hired like a hundred and something people around kind of like where, where we are. And we bought two vans and we'd have 
a van that would drop off product on like Tuesdays and Thursdays to all these people who wanted to work for us. And then we'd have another van that would collect it on like two other different days. So they would get paid basically by the volume that they, that they did. And we were able to like, we'd have, man, there was tons of people in the Tri-Cities here that you know, weren't able to work. It worked out for everybody. Like there was like teachers who wanted to just make a little extra money while they're watching TV. My dad was doing it. People were just like kicking around, putting around bored or wanting more money. We're not doing it anymore. We're quite a bit bigger now, but that was one of the, the big things for us was how do we keep packaging in an environment where you can't have people close to each other? Right on, man. Good for you. Because so, so many businesses just kind of threw up their hands in those days, right? And like, you know, I mean, to be fair, there were a lot of businesses that no matter, they couldn't have overcome that challenge. And they were, the government came and shut them down or whatever. But you guys, you know, adapt and overcome. Right on, man. That's awesome. Yeah. And like, it was great for like, not just for the business, but it was also great for the community because it gave a lot of people that were screwed up by COVID. Wow. Right. Did you make some like press about that? Did, like, that is actually amazing that you put that together. Like, did you get some cred for that? We didn't actively promote it, but there was a million other things that were happening at the exact same time. Like we were donating to like hospitals and families that didn't have, uh, couldn't afford, they were negatively impacted by the, the crisis. Like, I think we donated, we donated like millions of dollars worth of product. I don't even. Wow, man, that is. Can I get a quick time horizon on this real quick? When did you start this? And what, yeah, I, I just a quick time horizon of that. And I don't know, like maybe market cap, like when you were at this point, just so I get a context of like what you were managing, like what the volume was. We sold our first product. We opened the website on April 2nd, 2019. We got to like an eight figure okay. run rate in like eight months. I, I don't remember exactly where we were along the way, but like we wound up raising, we did a raise earlier this year. So it's been about, we did a raise approximately three years into the growth, but before that it was all bootstrapped. Oh, you bootstrapped it. So from 2019, no, no outside investment, huh? What do you, what are you guys at now? Like strong mid eight figure. Wow. wow. That is crazy. When you started 2019, what was like your, I guess your budget when you just got started, when you're just, just beginning? It's funny. We didn't really have a budget. It was like, we just kind of, I know it sounds ignorant, but I had a couple other brands and I just, we just set up, I set up some ads and I think, I think I set up like probably like 500 bucks a day or something like that, or 400 bucks a day to, to test. And man, it was like, we were getting like $7 purchases. Like I would, I would do horrible horrible things now to get $7 purchases. We just kind of pushed it during that period. I don't remember exactly how much we, but there was a point where we were spending in that first month, like over $2,000 a day. Yes. Yeah, so you scaled super quick then basically. But you think you're going to sell to like a, to like a tide or like something like that? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know, man. Like the goal is to eliminate plastic and create more consumer goods that do eliminate plastic. I don't mm. necessarily think that PNG would be that that fits their kind of like their, their business model. Right. But if they were coming along and they wanted like it made sense and they were actually looking to positively impact and roll things out across their business, mm -hmm. it's more about impact. Right. I know you're you're a family guy. Do you have like a COO? Like how are you running all this? How much of it the day to day are you running all this stuff? First of all, I'm not the CEO. Brad's Brad's our oh, CEO. Okay. I'm the chief marketing officer. So I, I primarily handle the marketing. In the beginning I, I like, you know, did Okay. wore a lot of hat in the beginning brad handled more of the distribution and fulfillment and he was kind of doing the operations and like he was the ceo from the beginning but he's stepped into like really leaned into more ceo responsibilities and we do have a ceo as well what was the first marketing campaign you did to launch a product in the beginning when we first started this whenever we start new projects we always make like a number that if we don't hit that we're going to put a bullet in it and we built this framework we call it v loss validate launch optimize scale and when we first started we wanted to hit 150 customers in the first month that we thought if we hit that we've proven that there's enough of a business potentially here that we could we could we could move forward with it build a website and the first thing at that time 2019 facebook ads were still unbelievably powerful their attribution was still on point basically honestly i put together five ads took a picture like it was so simple i literally took a picture of my hand holding the product over my washing machine i think the creative that won was something along the lines of like finally true earth is available in canada or something like that and then we talked a little bit about the benefit, the environmental benefit. The first day there wasn't actually like somebody I knew was the first customer who purchased the product. And then like it was day two, all of a sudden the, you know, that commercial from IBM or whatever, where it's like ding, 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 ding. All the sales started rolling in yeah. on day two. And like, to be perfectly honest, a lot of the initial wins were just Facebook. Two weeks in, we did a subscription box campaign where we put the product in. And you ran that on Facebook as well? No. So that, that literally the product went in like a subscription box. So like one of those boxes that like it was for women, the product went in the, a female based subscription box, a bunch of other products. 
and we had this offer that you could get your first pack on the subscription for two bucks and like it killed. So you put it into another subscription box. You collaborated with like another subscription box service. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And they had, you said 7,000, you said? I think it was 7,000. I can't remember the exact number. It's been a few years. But wait, this ad you ran that said True Earth is now available in Canada, that was just like a Facebook ad to a page where they would just go and buy like what, one box or buy the subscription? It was a subscription. So Oh, so you started with a subscription. Yeah. Initially, we only had subscriptions unless you like wanted to send a customer service message that, hey, I just want to try it first. I can tell you some like some stupid that where we screwed up on that, that like other people could probably benefit from. Quick Cole's notes is like, we only offer like total oversight. We only offered monthly subscription. Yeah. Like a dude that lives by himself that primarily works from home does not do a ton of laundry. So by like month three, dude's got enough laundry for like the next year. What wound up happening, guys are lazy. They probably forget to, to go and cancel and then they get month four and they get month five. And then every time they look at this product now, they're getting like dissonance that, oh my God, this stupid product. I need to call and cancel it or I need to go log in and cancel it. And they start getting a negative experience tied to the product and they don't come back and buy again. So the, the, the stupidest, simplest thing that we, that we overlooked in the first two or three months was like simply just offering different frequencies and obviously letting people default buy without a subscription. Um, and our, our lifetime value dramatically increased after we made that change because we, we eliminate a lot of that like cognitive dissonance tied to the product. Oh, that's interesting. And I mean, come on, let's be honest, guys wear their underwear like three days in a row, like, you know, inside out, backwards, forwards. I think I'm on five. <laughs> But at the same time, like if you're running a campaign, you know, one call to action subscription, you know, is a good, you know, have that as your campaign. I guess maybe they have the option to maybe click and go somewhere else, go to the homepage and buy it versus like you have a landing page on your website that's just for the subscription it would make sense. But you're saying that they didn't have any option. All they could do is get the subscription. Yeah, they would go to the lander, the more direct response style lander than like an e-com PDP. How much was the subscription? Twelve ninety five. Oh, interesting. Per month? Yeah. And then you would get what? How many strips? Thirty two. Oh yeah. A little bit more than one a day. That's too much. And the math we read, like reading through statistics was that the average family of four does one load of laundry, not like per day. That's including like your kids pissing the bed or like, you know, towels and like, Oh really? Oh wow. I'm sure we do at my house, but we do multiple loads a day. So it, it starts to escalate. Really, Tom? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, Tom, you have what, four kids? Five kids. <laughs> so. Five kids. Holy shit. Oh, my God. I have three. You're crazy. <laughs> yeah, so we need a lot of true earth. <laughs> I'll send you some, though. Don't worry. For sure, man. That's cool. You can try it out. Man, I only do like like two or three loads a week, maybe. I only wash my, my laundry like once a week, you know? But I thought when I was like 25 and living by myself that I could wash my bedding like once every two months. But apparently, you're supposed to wash it like once a week or something or... Yeah, I, I wash my belly once a week. I've actually had this conversation recently with someone else. And uh, anyways... It's very, very hygienic of you, Matt. <laughs> my, my girlfriend's a nurse. And so she she's always doing laundry, right? Because she comes home from work and she's got to take off her scrubs. And you know, uh, she has to... She go, does way more laundry than I do because she's a nurse and she's got to be super, super hygienic. Going back to the whole marketing stuff, I was checking out your... The True Earth YouTube channel. You guys have a crap ton of views for 5,000 viewers, or f excuse me, 5,000 subscribers. Good job on that. I love, Thank you. I wasn't able to watch some of your videos here because we're recording this episode here, but uh, you definitely have some really good looking content that I've got to check out after we're done here. And I was hoping to maybe share a kick-ass idea with you. Are you open to uh, talking some YouTube shorts? Yeah, man. I'm, I am always down Yeah, because you are a hell of a lot bigger expert than I am on that topic. I'd love to hear your insights. I'm such an uber geek. I, I always get excited when I see a brand that's active on YouTube. I'm like, oh, you guys get it. Yes. You know, like, like, I don't have to convince you guys of the power of YouTube and you, you being the CMO, you clearly have had, I don't know how many conversations about this channel. It looks like you have, I, I want to say like a handful of people that you've kind of tapped on the shoulder to creating YouTube content. I can see a redheaded woman uh, doing a lot of these YouTube shorts and these are all standalone shorts. I'm going to take a stab in the dark here and guess that you guys haven't started experimenting with YouTube short remixes yet, because that's a relatively new feature. Is that fair to say you guys haven't tried remixes just yet? That is a very fair thing to say. Okay. So love that you got a video with Dave Asprey here too. I got to check that out. So I think we can all agree that in any marketing strategy, if it's a proactive approach, it's going to beat out a reactive approach, right? I mean, maybe not 10 times out of 10, but I think we can agree nine times out of 10, that that's the way you're going to want to go. So the next time you guys are meeting as a team and you're talking about your content strategy and you're 
laying out a regular uh, video format that you're going to deploy. I'm going to, you know, just organize your videos by most popular. Looks like three minutes, four and a half minutes, three minutes. And then you got some really short videos here too. So what you do is when you put together a video that's a four minute video, you single out the most snackable, most compelling, most shocking section of that video. Maybe it's 27 seconds. Maybe it's 35 seconds. It's got to be less than 59 seconds. Because right. for whatever reason, when you upload a short, YouTube likes to add a second. At least they're, they're doing that right now. Hopefully they'll fix that eventually. So if you try to upload a short that's like 60 seconds, YouTube will add a second and then it's no longer a short. It becomes a regular YouTube video upload. Okay. But when you're putting the video together, oh, I didn't know that. yeah, it's one of those random things. I, hopefully YouTube will figure it out. It has been the case uh, recently. So what you do is when you're making this four minute video, this three minute video or what have you, you pick that section where you're like, that's fire. Like that is the compelling, shocking, oh my God moment. And when you edit the video, you make it in vertical portrait format, but it's with built with inside the video because you know that after you publish the video, in most cases, I'm, you know, I'm generalizing here when I say this, gotcha. but in most cases, in most YouTube channels, this is what we see. The browse traffic just blows up and then it starts to, to come down. It could be two days later, three days later, seven days later. And if it's a really epic video, when the browse traffic comes down, that's when the suggested traffic starts coming up. That doesn't always happen, but like if it's a really killer video, that's the pattern that, that's like the successful pattern that we're always looking on for. On shorts as well or just on full length? Sorry, I'm talking long form videos, long form videos. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Shorts have such a weird behavior right now, but, uh, and it's probably gonna be weird for a while, but that's cool, we can, we can leverage that. We can use that to our advantage. You post the video and let's say it's a four minute video. Let's say you actually made the the hook the first 27 seconds or so built in in a, U, uh, a youtube short format that vertical format so and i don't want you to leave like black space on the left and the right side of the screen you can put whatever the hell you want there but you want to optimize it for youtube short right yeah. so you post the video let's say three days later the browse traffic starts coming down that's when you go in to youtube with your your mobile device okay and then you go, you log in as yourself, as as True Earth, and then you hit the remix button because you're, uh, and you have to be logged in as yourself for this to work. Okay. And then you turn that section that was pre-built as a YouTube short, you turn that section into a YouTube short remix. So then what YouTube does, pulls that, that section of the video out, creates a brand new video with a brand new domain, brand new URL, brand new link. And then you can optimize the, the description and maybe a pinned comment. But the point is now when people are consuming that YouTube short remix, there's a button on the screen that takes them to the long format video. YouTube loves multi-format channels, meaning channels that are uploading regular videos and shorts and live streams and community posts. Those kinds of channels are always going to have the unfair advantage. But in my experience with all of the testing that I've done with all of my clients' channels, I very rarely say something works every time because obviously I don't want to get myself in trouble. I don't get my foot stuck in my mouth because there's going to be that like, Andrew, I tried your trick and it didn't work, man. Well, okay, fine. <laughs> fair enough. It does, doesn't work every time, but I've uploaded standalone shorts. I've uploaded short remixes and the short remixes, in my experience, beat out the standalone shorts shorts every single time in my experience. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to quantify that there. And I always see a spike of new subs the very next day too. And there's like a huge, huge spike of views and then it kind of plateaus, but there's always a huge push of views right away. YouTube loves remixes right now. So it's like the TLDR on this, like, I mean, obviously you should be probably doing this anyways, but on your long form video, make sure that the hook is amazing. Not clickbaity, but like you want to, you want to build the anticipation in that hook. I know you probably should do it anyways, but not so much just with the intent of keeping the people on your main video, but also with the intent of being able to repurpose that as, as a remix to promote the Hell yeah. The idea is that you don't need context. Hooks do not need context. You want something shocking or compelling or interesting. You guys need to get like Jason Momoa involved or something, because I don't know about you guys, but if you see him posting anything on social media, it's all about like, let's get rid of plastic. Let's get rid of plastic. Like someone better hook you up with Jason Momoa, because I'm sure he would, he would want to collaborate with you guys and stuff. If I was a girl, I would like Jason Momoa. Like <laughs> if I, you know, like he's, 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 uh, it's funny because yesterday I was looking at Twitter and I was looking at this one guy who clearly thought that he looked like Jason Momoa and had like the J Jason Momoa, like duck beard and like the, J the slightly thinning version of Jason Momoa hair, but like had like this like wind blowing in his hair type picture. And I'm like, I was like showing people I'm like this dude 100% thinks that he looks like Jason Momoa, but he's, he looks like the anorexic, slightly male pattern baldness version of him. Get him on. I'm not going to say his name because I'm not going to be a <laughs> <laughs> Just do the, he'll, he'll be the budget version. Yeah. The dollar store. <laughs> dollar store. Exactly what I was going to say. Dollar store Jason Momoa. Yeah.
Hey, uh, real quick on this on the strategy, Andrew. I did this once or twice. What I noticed is that I could take any part of the video, even like a few seconds, I think, and then add in my own stuff after. So even if you just had something like a one second thing, you just start that, use the one second, and then put yes. you know another fifty eight seconds of your of whatever else that you've already formatted. Yeah. So anybody can do that. Mm. Anybody can create a remix on anyone else's content. So yeah, you put up like five seconds of their content or whatever, and and then and then the camera turns on to you, and then now you're reacting to that content. The strategy I just described to Ryan is not that. This, uh, uh, I th And I think you get that, but yeah, that's another way to do it. No, but I, I'm going on my own. I think I can go on, like, on, on my channel, take one of my videos, say I want to turn this into a reel. Yeah. I hit the button, whatever, a short. Sorry, not a reel, a short. I don't have to use only the footage from yeah. the video on YouTube. I could use like a, like, I don't know what the minimum amount is. You, you can add like a reaction moment to that afterwards, yeah. Yeah, like the, probably just like 10 seconds of it and then I could just, but then I could upload my own video and then have that be the rest of the reel, right? So I don't have to plan out one minute inside the whole video. I could just yeah, definitely have something. The reason why I'm highlighting that is because specifically nobody's doing that. Right, right. I, I heard about it a while ago. It's catching on right now as we speak. Yeah. More and more people are, are doing that. You can go to like any of your, Ryan, dude, you could go to any of your successful videos right now and you can check out the retention graph. Yeah. You can see bumps, right? You can see totally. valleys and, and spikes. And maybe those bumps are areas that people really found enjoyable. So they rewound and watch that section again. And then you can turn that section into a remix short, right? However, it's not always clear why there's a bump there. It could be a positive reason. It could be a negative reason. Maybe they, there was something in the video that per the person didn't really understand. Okay. So they had to rewind and watch it again, or they couldn't really. That's a potential as well. Again, it's uh, all about being proactive versus reactive. And what the strategy I just described, that, that's just catching, catching on right now. If you had a video that had a couple different places where there were spikes, is there any reason why you wouldn't do this multiple times or should you only have one remix per video? Great question. For the most part, from what I can tell, you've got more shorter style videos. And when I say shorter, I mean like anything less, or, less than 10 minutes. Yeah. So for most of your videos, I would probably say one short is enough. But if there were like two really compelling or really shocking moments in that video, yeah, totally get two sh shorts out of there. And the other thing that I forgot to mention is you're think about it. You're double dipping. You're already investing the time, money and effort to create the video. So if you're building in one or two shorts within the video, and then later on you turn those sections into a remix, well, now you're getting two for one. Now you're getting three for one. And, and in your case, your channel is obviously monetized. For anyone who has a monetized channel, now you're generating ads on the YouTube shorts and on the long format. You're double dipping. Totally. Also, I was just thinking, the reason my question was kind of tied to that is that like, you know, typically with shorts, you see like, you know, you get like a one hour burst of views. Sometimes, sometimes it get, goes longer. It goes a little bit crazier. You get a second burst, you know, a few weeks or like a month later, randomly out of the blue. But like, because those bursts are so concentrated, I think like doing a second short potentially gives you the opportunity, especially if you're doing it at a different time of the day to access different people in different, maybe different markets or, or different segments of the same audience, maybe regionally. That's a really good point because you, you have a global brand here, right? So you should be testing, uh, posting at different times of the day and different days of the week. Using that, that strategy I just described a moment ago, again, there is a link on the short that drives traffic to the long format content. Whereas when you upload a standalone short, you don't get that benefit. Yeah, yeah. There's no data relationship between the short and the long. Most companies are going to tell you, most YouTubers are going to tell you that where they're generating the real loyalty, the real influence, the real credibility, the real authority is then the long format content. Most experts will tell you that there isn't a lot of loyalty with short format content yet. Yeah, It's probably coming. But I mean, think of how many times you guys have watched a TikTok or a short or a reel, but you can't really name that creator. Mm -hmm. You, like you would recognize them, but like, oh, what is their name again? The association isn't quite as strong as when someone's watching your long format content. Yeah. Like my son, we, we've been producing, or we slowed down now, but we were making a couple, he was making a couple shorts a day for Minecraft and he got to like 1200 subscribers. Matt's seen a couple of videos and then we would post, we you know we would post a long form video and like he's eight. So don't have all the Mr. Beast dopamine hits as a regular video, but because of the retention rate probably being lower and the CTR not being as high, they tend to, the impact of those subscribers from the shorts tends to be fairly minimal. It's a very different viewing experience, especially when you consider how quick and snackable it is compared to the long format content. Yeah, the viewers watching your long format content are much more willing to go deeper and they're much more into you, right? Whereas the snackable short content 
they're they're swiping and they're looking for that thing to get their attention right away. And if you don't grab their attention right, right away, they're going to swipe. And when they swipe, I guarantee you the next short is not yours. It's a very different viewing experience. So when you or any business for that matter sits down and strategizes your short content strategy, you want to think of them as video memes or trailers or teasers that you're just teasing out your your brand to the viewer and trying to entice and compel them to say, hey, check out all this awesome, amazing, free, long format content that we have too. But you're you're bang on. It's a totally different viewing experience. Yeah, I want to talk about what is the strategy right now? Because I know I just, I'm on your Instagram and your, your YouTube, looking at all these different shorts content. And I see like, I feel like there's definitely some brainstorming of creativity, like different ideas, because they're all filmed kind of like in the house, right? There's this, yeah. who, wh who's the person, the, the woman on the video? So videos? her name's Sydney. Yeah. So does Sydney just come up with it? Or do you guys all brainstorm? Here are some of my different ideas how we could how we could display this in, you know in the short form content. Good question. So a buddy of mine, his name is Isaac. He owns a brand called Mini Katana. They are absolutely slaying short form content in terms of promoting e-commerce. We're trying to work off that model a little bit, but what we're trying to do initially is identify buckets of content that our uh, our community likes. I'm sure I'm sure Andrew's. I see Andrew nodding his head because that's a very Daryl Evesy type thing to say, but we're trying to identify the, the buckets that resonate the most with our customers. And we're doing like some ethnography work right now outside of this to, to see which buckets are probably the most beneficial for us as a brand. So she's testing a whole bunch of stuff. We're, we're building like a bit of a feedback loop system to see which particular types of content perform the best. And then our intentions are to scale that both internally as well as using influencers who already have the understanding of how to go viral on their own. So like I say influencers, but I meant creators, but like it's one thing to go and get, there's all these, there's like a billion creators on, on like Instagram and TikTok that, you know, aren't actually fantastic at creating viral content. They just film stuff and they call themselves the UGC creator. I think where the real value is if you can find somebody that's kind of already in your vertical making content that's relevant to your audience and signing them to a deal to continuously produce content in particular buckets for your brand. The understanding that those people know how to make this type of content go viral and then basically essentially paying them for that content. Do you guys do any kind of affiliate play right now? Yeah, we do a bit of affiliate. It's uh we had, we were doing it pretty hard for a little bit. You know, attribution gets gets difficult when somebody's like an Instagram influencer or whatever because most of it you can't click. So then you wind up relying on coupon codes and then you get like coupon code aggregators taking their coupons and it just screws up all of the data. We we do some. It's just it's not uh I would say it's not our strongest channel. So, what's your guys' like process for kind of coming up with these buckets coming up with these different ideas you guys like get on a call together and just kind of brainstorm it how do you how do you plan this out i mean we've, we've only been doing it for probably six weeks well, what about all these other videos we, we've been doing it for a long time but we just started doing it like making it a priority maybe six eight weeks ago and initially it was like okay let's figure out a handful of buckets let's start producing content ideally we're going to probably get to a point where everything's aggregated into a spreadsheet where we can see what bucket it was how many views it had and then we could take the time to go look at it and look at the retention graphs to see exactly what things probably caused that initial spike. And like, th I mean, the thing about YouTube and I know Andrew, Andrew will probably agree with me. Like I was experimenting with it with my son's videos like six weeks ago. Sometimes I would upload a video and it would get zero. Like you look at it and like you, sometimes it would get muted from the shorts feed and it would never get any action on the shorts feed. And then I would upload the exact same video an hour later. I, I changed the title or whatever. All of a sudden it would get 10,000 views. There's this like secondary thing that you, it's completely uncontrollable where you're just at the mercy of the algorithm on that particular day and that particular time could hurt you, right? Yeah. You know, as a whole, on a macro level, getting all of this data, putting it into a spreadsheet, breaking it down by views and buckets, and then doubling down on the things that have worked. Really, it's it's a feedback loop. It's data science. And like a lot of people just like, you know, I see most brands just post stuff on social media. It's usually just, it's mostly an echo chamber of them broadcasting how great their product is versus like telling stories or entertaining or, you know. And what you just described there, you're, you were split testing the title. If you uploaded the exact same video, you were split testing the title. I don't know the details, obviously, but for like what Daryl Eves would say is he's data driven, but optimizes for human beings. And it, yes, there was obviously a slight uh, change in time of day, right? but if everything else was equal and all you changed was the title, for whatever reason, that second title just resonated with the audience that much easier. The only thing is, is that like where I think the glitch is, especially when I notice it with volume is... Typically, when it gets this, this quote unquote glitch that I'm speaking of, is that you'll see zero shorts feed mm. activity. If there's zero shorts feed activity, you never even got exposure to even give the, the title a chance. Yep, that's fair. 
I can't figure out why it happens. It's happened on a number of my accounts a few times. And I know deleting your content and putting it back up is not a good idea, but like it should have got at least like one. I, I don't know why that happens. I don't know, but this whole, if you delete your content and re-upload, I've done it before where I would upload something, get like 10 views, I delete it, put it back up and it'll get like a hundred, whatever, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you could actually take the exact same one you've already posted and republish it. I just did that recently and it still worked. So if you had one from like six months ago that worked, just re-upload it now with a different title, boom. If you have a little bit of editing, just change the music in the background yeah. or something and then and change the file name, whatever. Yeah, I would I would try to make an effort to change it at least somewhat because if it's the exact same video, it's actually against the terms of service and then you get a couple strikes and then all of a sudden you're in big trouble. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I've been noticing big creators doing it. Yeah, I was going to say a similar thing. Like yeah, it's against YouTube's terms of service. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have like really big uh, YouTubers that did that. And I was like, oh, interesting. They're just re-uploading. I saw someone who has a YouTube channel about, you know, this sort of strategies talking about it. And then all of a sudden I saw some big creators. I'm like, oh, they're doing the thing. They're just re-uploading the same thing twice. Yeah. Big YouTubers make mistakes all the time. Really quick, Ryan, just because, just because of the time frame you just shared with us, I avoided YouTube shorts like the plague off of the advice of my mentor, Daryl Eves. It was a proven fact for any data geek like me, when you get into the nitty gritty, you could see that the YouTube shorts were cannibalizing views from the long format content. Some of the largest YouTubers on the planet were complaining about losing $20,000, $30,000 and more because they were uploading YouTube shorts. This was a known fact in the YouTube expert co consultancy space. I never, I didn't go near YouTube shorts with a 10 foot pole until they YouTube solved that, that steaming pile of disaster. So just because uh, you said it was so long ago, I suspect that they were still like ironing out the kinks. I'm not going to say that YouTube has solved all of their problems. Yeah, I'm yeah. not saying that, but we are so far beyond, like I'm actually posting shorts on, on my clients' channels now, whereas before I didn't, I wouldn't touch them with, with anything. Let's talk about some of these viral videos you've created. I'm looking on your YouTube channel. You've got, I mean, this one here on true earth laundry strips, the zero waste laundry detergent. I'm sure you're running ads to these, right? But you've got like 11 million, 8 million, 5 million, 4 million. Like how are you coming up with these? Are these, is this like a Harmon brothers thing? Or are you just kind of using that sort of concept? Tell me about this whole process of creating these sort of funny style viral videos. Yes, I, I was part of the Harmon Brothers community. Actually, I've been on I, I, I've been on one of their podcasts once a couple years ago, but I had joined, I took the course. I don't take a lot of courses, but I took that course. And uh, one of the videos on there that's not funny, I actually used their framework and made a video that wasn't funny. And it actually did extremely well on YouTube in early 2020. I was looking to try to figure out how to do a funny video myself. And I happened to run into somebody inside of their community that did a video for Russell Brunson. And it was pretty cool. It was like his energy drink thing. I just like, hey man, like what does something like that cost? Because by the time I figure all this out, there's opportunity costs that are, that are gonna happen. The price that he quoted me was like, well, that's very reasonable at the time. We started moving forward with it. COVID hit and we wound up delaying it a little while, but I can give you the, the, the really rough format for how to make a Harmon Brothers style video. It's basically pattern interrupt, like some sort of hook. And then you have your, your problem or whatever pro problem your product solves, the problem, the solution, a call to action, social proof and objection busting, another call to action, and then an outro so that you give people an opportunity to click on the second call to action because sometimes they're on their TV or, or whatever. And then part of the Harmon Brothers methodology is mention your brand name as many times as possible inside the context of the video without it sounding awkward or weird. And then the hook can be anywhere from like 15 seconds to like up to a minute. I know most people are against the minute long hooks, but like sometimes they don't even mention the brand until like 30, 40 seconds in or the problem, but it's designed to draw you in, entertain. Basically it's the attention economy. How do you keep people sucked in? And these videos are really popular on YouTube. I was in the disruptors group at Facebook, which is the highest level of support that you can get. These are so against best practices, but it's crazy that we can't beat these as a control. Like we want to do a case study on you for long form video because normally this is not what we see on the platform. Interesting. Did they, they went through that with you? Well, actually the disruptor group actually got the NDA. They ended that program and moved people into uh, category specific sections inside the, inside the company, which that's where we are. But that, that never wound up coming to fruition, unfortunately. It's like very direct response marketing style approach to, to short form video with some some nuances to the platform in terms of calls to actions and whatnot. Yeah, it's 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 a direct response formula with entertainment layered into it, right? Like they're funny videos, right? Like they're goofy. They make some like off color jokes. Oh yeah. 
yeah you know our brand isn't off color but like there's a bunch of jokes being made to which essentially maintains that attention which one of these videos do you think you got the most roi from um there's probably you know it's there's three of them um and it's hard to say because they all came out at different times but mm-hmm. the the first one was things you should never mix with water that one was huge like insane insane like the views were like we had over a million views like day one ads or like how how'd you spark it yeah so the first one we we turned on the ads we put it into i i have this like community uh, group on facebook i basically said hey if you share this uh video to your facebook profile it's public i'll, I'll send you a free pack so i got a, i got a pretty good organic boost there it was a group for truth customers or no, it's just like I, I when during the pandemic, I built a, a local community for small businesses and for people to try to find uh, restaurants and grocery stores that delivered food so that they didn't have to go to uh, restaurants. Basically, eight thousand people in, in in this area here, all in that group. I started a a, a child care group in the newest minister. It's blowing up. I got lots of money to them. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ever want to uh, post in there, I uh, hook you up. Dude, I know that you're uh, uh, you're engaged now. Congratulations. But that probably would have been, been like, you, you could have been the, the, the king. Yeah, I used to live in the US and I was looking for childcare. And so now I got like over 2,000, 3,000 members or whatever. And so, anyways, <laughs> totally on topic. I do specifically remember that one incident that you had in the US with the, the news. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> 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 I'm not even in Canada and I saw that too. So what happened here? So they shared it, you know, that sort of thing. So I guess that sparks some you're running ads what else do you do to kind of get that initial boost of views on these videos yeah i mean it, it, honestly obviously things evolve but we were not only just running purchase objectives on facebook we also at that time for that first one we were also running engagement wait you were running ads on facebook to, for a video on youtube no sorry sorry the video on facebook has way more views than the video on youtube does oh i see so you upload the video on your facebook page run ads to that mm-hmm. yeah we also ran youtube ads to those videos and some of them we still do oh uh, i see i see i see the video on youtube you run ads to them right or did they because mm-hmm. like, i'm seeing these like you know five million views ten million you know it's not best practices the way that we have it structured we didn't know we put the ads on our main account we probably should have had them on we should have had them on another account andrew i'm definitely see him nodding his head he's like yep and we're, we're probably going to migrate that because it muddles muddies your data right for mm-hmm. the organic side oh i see i see i see but you did run ads on youtube to these videos here mm-hmm. and would you find that once it picks up steam from the ads that you start getting more organic I'd say that you're probably more likely to get like brand search. So when you run YouTube, YouTube ads, you're going to typically see your purchase attribution that happens on whatever platform you're using to track it, Wicked or Wicked Reports or Google Analytics. And then oh. you're also going to see just a general like lift as a whole because some people are watching YouTube on a TV and they can't click. And Google Analytics absolutely sucks at cross-platform tracking between a TV and a phone. So the metrics that you're going to see in addition to the views on the video itself is your branded search is probably going to go up. If you look at like Google Trends for your brand or like the title of the video, you'll probably see more of that. Right, right, right. YouTube's a, a tricky one for attribution because there are like secondary and tertiary benefit from a direct response perspective. You're not going to be able to measure similar to like a TV ad. I've never worked with a business quite like yours, Ryan. You offer a, like a free a lead magnet, a tripwire or something a freebie or promo code. Yeah. Something to uh, entice the viewer to enter their details, their email address. You can nurture them. They can enter your sales funnel. You can convert uh, typically a higher percentage of those leads into paying customers or clients simply because in my experience, YouTube has a lot easier time developing that know, like, and trust factor versus the other platform choices, at least uh, with the, the client's channels that I have access to. Their YouTube attribution has the highest conversion rates as opposed to Facebook ads or Google organic or you name it. They have the best conversion rates from their YouTube program. But wait, but Ryan's saying that that's not the case. No, I'm not saying that's not the case. I'm just saying that there's multiple ways to measure it. What's your main call to action on your YouTube program? It's usually like click here to try. And we usually have like a risk-free trial. Like we're not doing a special offer, right? I understand like the value of an offer specifically tied to a creative, but remember that we're not just direct to consumer. We're also in retail. So there's the fine line between like when you're in D2C and you're in Amazon and you're in retail, you have potential channel conflict. Mm. And like a retailer is going to be upset if you're saying like, get your first shipment free. And then, you know, like, because now somebody's, you're advertising the brand, but you're drawing them away from retail. And there's a stat, I can't remember exactly what it is, but like people will go to a grocery store that contains like a particular product that they wanna, that they wanna purchase. And it's usually 15 to $35 worth of products that dictate which store they go to if they like particular specialty products, and then they wind up spending 300 to $350. So if a store has X amount of stores that carries your product, there's an opportunity then 
to benefit across all their products in the store by virtue of people wanting to go there to purchase. Dude, you just taught me something. That is a problem I've never come across. That is fascinating. I've never come across that issue. Wow. Good to know. I learned that in the last three years too, man. It's uh, <laughs> learned a lot, actually. A lot of things I didn't know. So, so you look at YouTube as more of like a brand play, like just growing your brand awareness. And you see Facebook as more of like the direct response, get sales. It really depends, right? Like you have demand gen and there's demand capture. Anytime that you so show somebody video that, that like really, like the longer form the video, I mean, it's kind of like a VSL, right? The longer, longer form the video and much more of that video that person consumes, to sustain their interest, they're more likely to, to make a purchase. With YouTube, we see pretty good last click attribution, right? People look at it mm -hmm. from through such a, a small lens. It's like, okay, it made this many purchases, but like, in a vacuum, how many searches did that video make? Like on Facebook, everybody that's looking at Facebook is doing it on a device that they can click. You know, you're watching YouTube, you might be watching it on your TV, you might be watching it next to your kid. Right, right, right. And then you go and make an action later. So if you're basing what your optimal acquisition cost is on YouTube and you're directly comparing it to what it is on Facebook, that's not a fair comparison because YouTube is going to have these secondary and tertiary lifts that Facebook's less likely to have. Like they'll be measurable, the platform has, has clicks or whatever, right? YouTube has a s secondary benefit that's similar to TV in that it gets brand left. If you look at your brand in like Google Trends, you're more likely to see a higher lift from a YouTube video than Facebook. Oftentimes people have to go and search for it on their device. Let's talk about, because you, you mentioned that you're doing TV ads, right? So you've done YouTube ads, obviously you're doing Facebook ads, all video ad stuff. Now you moved over to doing actual TV ads. What happened with that? Are you running the same commercial that you ran on YouTube and Facebook on TV or? What's happening no. with TV ads? I think that's really interesting. TV is a bit different. Like you're either doing 15 second or 30 second. So we we actually recorded a video at my house. We hired a an agency to come down. We had a director, a grip, and a, a sound guy. We recorded a 30 second video at my house. It was like a founder spot. Basically talked about like, is this what your laundry looks like? Wouldn't you like it if it looked like this instead? We put it up um, primarily on linear, which is like regular TV. We also did uh, streaming, which is like Hulu and, and other things. Regular TV did surprisingly well. How do you measure that? Well, obviously there's a pixel on the site, but that doesn't do anything since you can't click through regular TV. What you do is you track a baseline traffic, baseline purchases by time of week on a running running period. And then with TV, you look at like a five minute window within running that particular creative. Any significant left above the the mean i guess becomes attributed oh interesting. So, so they'll tell you we're going to run the ad at this time yeah yeah so we know exactly what time it runs at oh interesting there's an algorithm that basically looks at it and it's it doesn't include like any other marketing channel so it's only direct traffic within a five minute window of the broadcast and it's crazy you can see you can see the spikes oh wow because i know like just brand queries in general help you with your seo a lot right like google mm -hmm. knowing people are just googling your name is going to help you know increase your page rank and all that kind of stuff so that's very interesting that like that could totally help even just overall your whole online presence, yeah. but obviously the brand awareness in the store. How long have you been doing the TV ads? Huge branded brand branded term lift with TV. It's insane. Oh, that's so interesting. And what about like cost wise? Are you kind of like investing the same amount in TV as you as you did on YouTube? Like, what's what are you doing there? I think we were actually more on TV than the top of funnel. Like we were, we were testing it right, right. like probably for, I don't know, three or four months. And like we were getting crazy good results. And the thing about TV, Canadian TV sucks because you it's all premium. You have to pay for it in advance, like three months in advance. But the American system's really cool. So basically you have your premium where you can buy like a very sp particular time on a very particular show. And we've done that a couple of times, but it's very expensive. But what winds up happening is there's a whole bunch of inventory that doesn't sell. And what happens is it's called Redmond inventory and it basically goes to auctions. So like oftentimes you can get like an $8,000 spot for $2,000 and it's like three or $4 CPM. Oh, wow. You can pick the channel. You can pick the time window. It's usually like within like a, with Remnant, it's like a two hour window instead of like a very specific spot. Mm. You can basically over time, you, you can analyze which channels, which times, which days of the week do well and then optimize for the CPA that you want to get. So do they have like an online platform that you would go to to be able to like select the stuff or you have to call someone? Like how does that work? Yeah. So we, we use a media buying agency that, that also has a platform and they do have a self-serve platform now. I don't know exactly mm. how it works. What The guys that we use are Tatari, but they have, there's a few. I mean, and like, I don't think it, it's not obviously not going to work in every single industry. Oh, I see. Yeah. We've literally tried one creative because the one interesting thing about TV is the rights. If you use proper actors, they're agents. They give you like time bound licenses to use. Uh -huh. So like a commercial with, you know, our, our funny video actors might be like $20,000 for like 13 weeks. I don't know what it is, but like it'd be like $20,000 per actor for 13 weeks. You have to take that into consideration. Like, does that now set the cost of that advertising medium like 
outside of the scope. Is that why you recorded yourself doing this video? Actually, it wasn't. We just didn't have, like the first experiment was like going through all the material we already had and could we hack something up into something that was effective in that time frame? And then since we couldn't do that, I, I talked to some friends that had success on these platforms and combined with kind of what the best practices from the, the agency told us, I, I did like a mashup between what I saw other friends having success with and what they told us was going to be successful. If I'm summarizing correctly, you started with like the scraps on TV, but from that you were able to optimize and see what's actually kind of winning partly. And then you also have another part of the strategy where you're going for particular shots with best guesses, right? Or yeah, yeah. educated guesses. And then you kind of like whittle it down there. It's more like we have the one ad, we have a 15 and a 30 second, and we made a couple different cuts. Mm. They all worked fairly well, but it was like different networks have different people watching them and not everybody responds to like talking about environmental stuff, right? So like generally people that are, are really conservative yeah. may not really resonate with the message, might not resonate with them. So trying to determine which channels, which timeframes have that customer avatar watching. There's testing. You test a whole bunch of different channels, a whole bunch of different time slots. You get a rough idea what they are. Then you you weed out the crap and you find out which channels are working. And then you, you test different time slots and you, you basically optimize your CPA to where you want it to be in. And then you just buy the amount of media that gets you costs that you want to spend on customers. It's interesting. You really got to nail the creative versus when we're talking things like these other platforms and whatnot that you can kind of quickly whip stuff up and kind of do a quantity uh, or, or volume play of content. This, you got to be very specific, right? Yeah. And the ad that we created for TV didn't really do very well on YouTube or Facebook. Yeah. It's super interesting. Sometimes you get good carryover, but like we tested it and we're like, oh, we're allowed to swear. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> but also I, I didn't have all these brown dots on my face when I was filming this video. Just for the record, I look much more handsome and young. <laughs> What do you think would, would made the biggest impact in terms of your, you know, your sales online, e-commerce wise? Would you say these videos and the creatives, that sort of thing, uh, optimizing your website, you know, maybe just some regular Google ads, PPC. What's the thing that you think makes the biggest impact? Historically, I was very organic focused and we've primarily been paid media focused with this brand. I think the future of paid media is, is 100% creative. You know, the intricacies of the platforms are no longer like what they were before. It's a lot more streamlined. But uh, for our brand, we obviously, I think the thing that really shot us into the stratosphere is when we upped our creative game. You can have good scrappy creative and, and produce lots of sales. The whole thing is iterative at the end of the day. We are constantly doing conversion rate optimization optimization test. There's like probably six or seven different split tests happening like right now. Just like YouTube, it's like you need to figure out what buckets have the most leverage. Continue testing things for each of those buckets, whether that's your attribution, your conversion rate optimization, your media mix, whatever those things are. But like figuring out, getting a hypothesis and testing it, doing that in concert is the only way you get like from 5 million to 50 million in a matter of years without taking capital. So you're saying it was the, the creative of the videos specifically? Yeah, like the creative, I mean, I, I'm gonna say like that was a catalyst, a huge catalyst for our growth. At the end of the day, like the difference between a 50 or like $100 million company versus like a million dollar company is that you can't have one person pulling all the levers. You you have to be identifying all the different levers of the business and incrementally improving each of them in order to in concert so that like we continue to grow in retail and get more stores. And then we also sell through in those stores. But then when we send people to our website, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're going to be profitable. So we need to have the page optimized so that the average order value is high enough to justify the spend. Like right. I hate to say that there's a hundred different things, but if I was a small business starting over again, the two things that I would focus on from an e-commerce perspective are three things. I'll say it's the creative that you're putting out there, whether it's organic or paid, the conversion rate optimization and making sure that your average order value and your lifetime value is as high as physically possible. And then the third thing is like the overall customer experience, because if you sell somebody something and then getting the product, paying for random duty you weren't anticipating, or, you know, it comes in a crumpled up package, like making sure that the customer experience is nailed, that feeds back into that lifetime value. And like, if I could focus on, if I was to restart from scratch, those would be the three things that I would put my eggs in. Actually, I bought this wallet from what I thought was like this cool website. There's a button and the cards stick up and it came in. It was from like 2016 packet mail from China. And there was like no instructions in it. Like there was like some threads hanging off the side of what I thought was carbon fiber. I've had stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, man, 
man, that sucks. I'm not going to tell anybody to buy this. I'm not a jerk, but I'm like, yeah, I've had that. I've had that experience. We're talking about marketing this whole time. Word of mouth is still the number one Trump factor. If you can't, I love that you just said that. And if I could just quickly build off of something you just said, when it comes to identifying different buckets of content that you're creating, whether it's YouTube or something else, a lot of businesses don't always recognize that you might have bucket ABC that is generating all your views or the majority of your views. You might have bucket uh, XYZ that's getting all your new subscribers. And then you might have a, a third bucket that's actually generating the bulk of your sales. Yes. The bucket that's generating the bulk of your sales might not be the most successful content, but that's where your most loyal viewers are. I love how you describe that because there is a lot to take into account. There's a lot. Yeah. And wait, what you just said, like, man, this is, this is one thing that I'm totally going on a tangent here, but like attribution platforms, everybody's hearing about like Alex Becker just got paid like yeah, yeah. $100 million. Probably problem with attribution platforms is they don't tell the entire story. They can't tell if somebody had a view through on YouTube. They can't tell if somebody had a view through on Facebook. If there was a video that was sitting at the top of your funnel that was telling your customer journey or sorry, your, your, your business story, your hero's journey, whatever you want to call it, and people consume that and they didn't make a purchase. And then three hours later, they got another ad that was like just an image ad and they clicked it. Every single attribution platform that exists is not going to include that video view in your lifetime, in your customer journey. Most people are gonna go and turn that off because it doesn't demonstrate contribution. And the issue with that, it, like, and that's the biggest fundamental flaw with how people measure attribution and, and brand and experience. We've come to this, come to terms in this world that like, we if we don't make a sale, on the first click or within like, we can't attribute it back. You know, the advertising platform sucks, but traditional marketing never worked that way. It's like, it's building up all of these different elements and touch points until you've built your customer or your potential customer to the point where their identity is tied to whatever it is that you've produced and they want to be part of that. And you want to make it so that your customer doesn't want to leave your brand because leaving your brand means that they lose their identity. And you can look at like Apple phones and Android phones like that. Like I'm never getting rid of my, my, my iPhone because I'm an iPhone user. You know, I'm not like, I'm not, there's like wars battled that are worse than religious battles of multiple centuries ago where people are like, oh, your iPhone doesn't have this feature that my Galaxy had like six years ago. And like, but, and they're like ready to kill each other. So. Anyways, I just want to know real quick, how do you do that? Because like you say that and I just think about it, like some of the brands that like I associate to myself and other, I know other people who are associated with certain brands and you're right, their identity gets tied to it. How do you do that? How do you create that? I mean, the first thing is like doing like some sort of like ethnography studies. So understanding like who your existing customers are, whether that's like surveys or getting on the phone, right. try to break down like how old they are. Like identify them. Yeah. 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 Identify them. And then like going to the communities where these people exist so that you're going to have a spectrum of different avatars and then trying to figure out where the bulk of them are and then find out where they exist inside of communities and look at the, the questions, things that those people are experiencing right? and what the kind of like common themes are. And then you need to build your brand and your core values around what's important to those people and what they aspire to be. The end goal is to like using your brand signals to other people the identity and person that they aspire to be and that when they stop using that or stop doing that particular thing when they quit your brand they're quitting their identity that is so interesting yeah if you can convince people and you can behave in such a way that people want to get to that point it's like the hero's journey thing right if you can get to the point where people associate their identity with your brand then it's game over. You've won the game. Yeah. That's perfectly put. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm just thinking about even like, you know, different YouTubers, influencers and stuff that people like really kind of get behind. And you're right. It's like, I like this idea of like, you create your brand around what they aspire to be. Right. Like I even think about like Gary Vee, for example. Right. And kind of this whole like hustle, you know, all this, this whole mentality of that. And people are like, yeah, I want to get behind that. Or we saw like Andrew Tate just pop off. Right. Like all these guys, like they aspire to be this, like, I don't know what, what he's trying to represent, yeah. you know? And then there's like these like big, like brands, like, you know, the, the Chanel's and the Hermes and stuff. And I see like the women who like, they like this luxury lifestyle and they like aspire to be that. So they buy these products to kind of feel like they're part of that. Right. I'm totally like that with Apple products. Hermes, you can't even, you can't even buy certain products until you spent a certain amount of money. Like you don't even qualify to buy a Hermes bag until you've bought the last generation down of Hermes bags. hundred percent. You're signaling inside of those ecosystems even, which, you know, status games suck, but <laughs> yeah, it's status and you know, whatever else, but yeah, I'm totally like Apple, all Apple kind of stuff, you know, and kind of like, I probably wouldn't let it go, but it's also the UI and all that stuff. But yeah, I do kind of like really love the brand, right? There's certain things like that, right? Like Andrew just loves the whole YouTube thing, right? He's not going to let it go. Right. And so I'm obsessed. <laughs> I'm yeah, I think that's really interesting because um, I have seen like true. I have seen these people who got could get behind your brand and love it. 
right? Like you have a lot of like raving fan customers that just like love the product. I've seen a lot of that. So I think that's very interesting. It's interesting when I go to like a, like a kid's birthday party. <laughs> this is, this happened to me right after COVID. I went to like a, like a birthday party thing and somebody's like, oh, you know, Ryan's, Ryan was with True Earth. And I got like, like five or six people like, oh my God, we love your product. And I like, to be honest, like outside of like marketing people, I don't really like love. I don't really li like, I like being introduced as myself and not the guy that is part of this thing. And it's like, I'm kind of like, it's weird attention for me, but uh, I kind of like try to go into these things and not really talk about what I do because most people have heard about it. And it's kind of like, this, I'm not saying I'm a celebrity, but it's weird when people find out what it is that I do and, and they know the product.